Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a star at the very least on my review of Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur C. Clarke, his first science fiction masterpiece since 2001, A Space Odyssey. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so... Dane reads... Rama, a metallic cylinder approaching the sun at a tremendous velocity. Rama, first product of an alien civilization to be encountered by man. Rama, a world of technological marvels and artificial ecology. What is its purpose in this year 2131? Who is inside it and why? So, let's go in and check out some tabs. And uh, right at the beginning here with chapter one, Space Guard, um, there are a few little bits here that I quite liked. Um, so I liked the, uh, they're talking about here, um, the effects of these like meteorite strikes. I like the fact that he chose out of all dates 11th of September for this this thing thing to happen, uh, which obviously is very sort of 9 11 y. Um, there's also some good stuff about people being permanently damaged uh, by their hearing and stuff. It's just a really like well done opening. So I'm going to read you the opening four paragraphs here. Chapter 1 Space Guard. Sooner or later, it was bound to happen. On 30th of June 1908, Moscow escaped destruction by 3 hours and 4,000 kilometres, a margin invisibly small by the standards of the universe. Again, on 12th of February 1947, yet another Russian city had a still narrower escape when the second great meteorite of the 20th century detonated less than 400 kilometres from Vladivostok, with an explosion rivalling that of the newly invented uranium bomb. In those days, there was nothing that men could do to protect themselves against the last random shots in the cosmic bombardment that had once scarred the face of the moon. The meteorites of 1908 and 1947 had struck uninhabited wilderness, but by the end of the 21st century, there was no region left on Earth that could be safely used for celestial target practice. The human race had spread from pole to pole, and so inevitably. At 9.46 GMT on the morning of 11th of September, in the exceptionally beautiful summer of the year 2077, most of the inhabitants of Europe saw a dazzling fireball appear in the eastern sky. Within seconds it was brighter than the sun, and as it moved across the heavens, at first in utter silence, it left behind it a churning column of dust and smoke. Somewhere above Austria it began to disintegrate, producing a series of concussions so violent that more than a million people had their hearing permanently damaged. They were the lucky ones. So we learn why it's called Rama. Long ago the astronomers had exhausted Greek and Roman mythology. Now they were working through the Hindu pantheon. And so 31439 was christened Rama. So basically after the, this initial meteorite strike that's covered, um, mankind thinks it might be wise to set up some sort of um, monitoring system to see what might be coming our way. And that's how we first discover Rama. And it's very unusual. It's not like any other meteorites that, that scientists are aware of. And we get a reference to H.G. Wells' The Star, which I haven't read yet, but which I probably should. Uh, so moving on to chapter three, Rama and Sita. I just enjoyed this opening paragraph. It's very, uh, it says a lot about human beings. The extraordinary meeting of the Space Advisory Council was brief and stormy. Even in the 22nd century, no way had yet been discovered of keeping elderly and conservative scientists from occupying crucial administrative positions. Indeed, it was doubted if the problem ever would be solved. Oh, and there's a theory that Rama's made out of antimatter, so Joe says, in three minutes we'll know if it's made out of antimatter. Norton grinned as he recalled some of the more hair-raising theories about Rama's origin. If that unlikely speculation was true, in a few seconds there would be the biggest bang since the solar system was formed. The total annihilation of 10,000 tons would briefly provide the planets with a second sun. But, uh, so he also points out, a matter-antimatter reaction involving even a few milligrams would have produced an awesome firework display. But that just makes me think, like, surely... They know it's not made out of antimatter because it would have, it would have hit matter even just in like little tiny dust mites as it as it travelled millions and millions of light years through space. So a ship called the Endeavour gets sent out to to kind of intercept Rama. Um, so we get we get this little uh, bit I want to read out. Now that Endeavour's orbit had coalesced with Rama's, they were heading sunwards like a single body. In 40 days they would reach perihelion and pass within 20 million kilometres of the sun. That was far too close for comfort. Long before then, Endeavour would have to use her remaining fuel to nudge herself into a safer orbit. They would have perhaps three weeks of exploring time before they parted from Rama forever. After that, the problem would be Earth's. Endeavour would be virtually helpless, speeding on an orbit which would make her the first ship to reach the stars in approximately 50,000 years. There was no need to worry, Mission Controller promised. Somehow, regardless of cost, Endeavour would be refuelled, even if it proved necessary to send tankers after her and abandon them in space once they had transferred every gram of propellant. Rama was a prize worth any risk short of a suicide mission. And of course, it might even come to that. 
Commander Norton had no illusions on this score. For the first time in a hundred years, an element of total uncertainty had entered human affairs. Uncertainty was one thing that neither scientists nor politicians could tolerate. If that was the price of resolving it, Endeavour and her crew would be expendable. Okay, and they find an entrance into Rama, and it's like a corkscrew, and they realise, um, it's not opening. Let's try the other way, suggested Mercer. This time there was no resistance. The wheel rotated almost effortlessly through a full circle. And it's because there's no reason that clocks and corkscrews should work the same on Rama as they do everywhere else. I thought this was cool world building as well about Dr. Bose. Dr. Bose had been born on Earth and had not emigrated to Mars until he was 30, so he felt that he could view the political situation fairly dispassionately. He knew now that he would never return to his home planet, even though it was only five hours away by shuttle. At 115, he was in perfect health, but he could not face the reconditioning needed to accustom him to three times the gravity he had enjoyed for most of his life. He was exiled forever from the world of his birth, not being a sentimental man. This had never depressed him on Julie. What did depress him sometimes was the need for dealing year after year with the same familiar faces. The marbles of medicine were all very well, and certainly he had no desire to put back the clock, but there were men around this conference table with whom he had worked for more than half a century. He knew exactly what they would say and how they would vote on any given subject. He wished that someday one of them would do something totally unexpected, even something quite crazy. And uh, so we learn about the Rama Committee. I just like the way that this deals with like time compression and transmitting um, information across space. The Rama, the Rama Committee was still manageably small, although doubtless that would soon be rectified. His six colleagues, the up representatives of Mercury, Earth, Luna, Ganymede, Titan and Triton, were all present in the flesh. They had to be. Electronic diplomacy was not possible over solar system distances. Some elder statesmen, accustomed to the instantaneous communications which Earth had long taken for granted, had never reconciled themselves to the fact that radio waves took minutes or even hours to journey across the gulfs between the planets. Can't you scientists do something about it? They had been heard to complain bitterly when told that face-to-face -face conversation was impossible between Earth and any of its remoter children. Only the moon had that barely acceptable one and a half second delay, with all the political and psychological consequences which it implied. Because of this fact of astronomical life, the moon, and only the moon, would always be a suburb of Earth. And so they have some of like what I would call holograms. Um, his stereo image, indistinguishable from reality, appeared, apparently occupied the chair to Dr. Bose's right. As if to complete the illusion, someone had placed a glass of water in front of him. Dr. Bose considered that this sort of technological tour de force was an unnecessary gimmick, but it was surprising how many undeniably great men were childishly delighted to be in two places at once. Sometimes this electronic miracle produced comic disasters. He had been at one diplomatic reception where somebody had tried to walk through a stereogram and discovered too late that it was the real person. And it was even funnier to watch projections trying to shake hands. We get this line, uh, after a century of determined efforts, Earth had still failed to get its population below the target of one billion. I always enjoy when uh, overpopulation is referenced in science fiction because it's interesting to see how it's handled. Uh, chapter 8 through the hub, so Newton is entering Rama, and I like this because there's a reference to uh, Howard Carter and Tutankhamun. And I'm a big sort of ancient Egypt uh, nerd, I even have a, a tattoo of an Ankh, um, an Ankh with the Eye of Horus. My mum's actually currently in Egypt as well. Never before had Norton felt so strongly his kinship with that long dead Egyptologist. Not since Howard Carter had first peered into the tomb of Tutankhamun could any man have known a moment such as this, yet the comparison was almost laughably ludicrous. Tutankhamun had been buried only yesterday, not even 4,000 years ago. Rama might be older than mankind. Uh, we get a reference to the myth of Oceanus, the sea which the ancients believed surrounded the earth. Uh, I use that as the title for a poetry collection. So this was uh, some really cool stuff. If you want to go from one star system to another, you have a number of choices. Assuming that the speed of light is an absolute limit, and that's still not completely settled, despite anything you may have heard to the contrary. There was an indignant sniff, but no formal protest from Professor Davidson. You can make a fast trip in a small vessel, or a slow journey in a giant one. There seems no technical reason why spacecraft cannot reach 90% or more of the speed of light. That would mean a travel time of 5-10 to 10 years between neighbouring stars. Tedious perhaps, but not impracticable, especially for creatures whose lifespans might be measured in centuries. One can imagine voyages of this duration carried out in ships not much larger than ours. But perhaps such speeds are impossible with reasonable payloads. Remember, you have to carry the fuel to slow down at the end of the voyage, even if you're on a one-way trip. So it may make more sense to take your time, 10,000, 100,000 years. Bernal and others thought this could be done with mobile worldlets a few kilometres across, carrying thousands of passengers on journeys that would last for generations. Naturally, the systems would have to be rigidly closed, recycling all food, air and other expendables. But of course, that's just how the Earth operates, on a slightly larger scale. So we learn Rama's been cruising through space for at least 200,000 years, and perhaps for more than a million. And uh, it's pointed out, no closed ecology can be 100% efficient. There's always waste, loss, some degradation of the environment and build-up of pollutants. It may take billions of years to poison and wear 
our outer planet, but it will happen in the end. The oceans will dry up, the atmosphere will leak away. And they find a stairway leading down into Rama. Um, it's actually built to climb up and not to go down. Um, and they discover the most efficient way is to slide down um, the handrail. And this was quite cool. Um, Careful examination of photos has shown that the height of the steps steadily decreased with the rise in gravity. The stairs had apparently been designed so that the effort required to climb them was more or less constant at every point in its long curving sweep. And we're talking about like many kilometers of steps here. Uh, the rule about of, of sex on board a ship is so long as they don't do it in the corridors and frighten the simps. Uh, it turns out simps are like super chimps, like research monkeys basically rather than the, the use of simps that we have today, but it did make me laugh. And I thought this was again some cool world building here. Um, so we talk about Boris Rodrigo. Uh, he was a devout member of the Fifth Church of Christ, Cosmonaut. Norton had never been able to discover what had happened to the earlier four, and he was equally in the dark about the church's rituals and ceremonies. But the main tenet of its faith was well known. It is believed that Jesus Christ was a visitor from space and had constructed an entire theology on that assumption. It was perhaps not surprising that an unusually high proportion of the church's devotees worked in space in some capacity or other. Invariably, they were efficient, conscientious, and absolutely reliable. They were universally respected and even liked, especially as they made no attempt to convert others. Yet there was also something slightly spooky about them. Norton could never understand how men with advanced scientific and technical training could possibly believe some of the things he had heard Christus state is incontrovertible fact. Okay, so uh, Boris, the uh, Christian uh, Cosmo Christ or whatever, um, he says, Commander, I believe I've discovered the purpose of Rama. Look at the situation. Here is a completely empty, lifeless world, yet it is suitable for human beings. It has water and an atmosphere we can breathe. It comes from the remote depths of space, aimed precisely at the solar system. Something quite incredible if it was a matter of pure chance. And it appears not only new, it looks as if it has never been used. Our faith has told us to expect such a visitation, though we do not know exactly what form it will take. The Bible gives hints. If this is not the second coming, it may be the second judgment. The story of Noah describes the first. I believe that Rama is a cosmic ark sent here to save those who are worthy of salvation. And uh, the water in the cylindrical sea uh, goes pea green. Um, so we get, we get this. What does that signify? Perhaps the same thing as it does on Earth. Laura called the sea an organic suit waiting to be shaken into life. Maybe that's exactly what's happened. In a couple of days. It took millions of years on Earth. 375 million according to the latest estimate. So that's where the oxygen's come from. Ram has shot through the anaerobic stage and has got to photosynthetic plants in about 48 hours. I wonder what it will produce tomorrow. So they make a boat to take to the sea. Um, and we get, if you have to swim for it, Dr. Ernst had warned the mariners, keep your mouths closed. A few drops won't matter if you spit them out right away. But all those weird organometallic salts add up to a fairly poisonous package and I'd hate to have to work out an antidote. This danger, fortunately, seemed very unlikely. Resolution could stay afloat if any two of her buoyancy tanks were punctured. When told of this, Joe Calvert had muttered darkly, remember the Titanic, which is true, the Titanic had a similar design where it could survive, I can't remember how many buoyancy tanks, maybe again, maybe it, was, it could survive if two of them were pierced and then three were pierced. And I thought this was cool as well, a little thing that makes the sea unique. The stairway was a virtual duplicate of the one down which they had descended on the other side of the sea. Doubtless his friends over there were looking straight across at him through their telescope, and straight was now the correct word. In this one direction, parallel to the axis of Rama, the sea was indeed completely flat. It might well be the only body of water in the universe of which this was true, for on all other worlds, every sea or lake must follow the surface of a sphere, with equal curvature in all directions. And then of course we get the first contact, uh, so Jimmy has his flyer, and he's... <laughs> uh, he was lying there, regaining his strength and wondering how soon it would be safe to open his eyes when there was a sudden crunching noise from close at hand. Turning his head very slowly towards the source of the sound, he risked a look, and almost lost consciousness again. Not more than five metres away, a large crab-like creature was apparently dining on the wreckage of poor Dragonfly. When Jimmy recovered his wits, he rolled slowly and quietly away from the monster, expecting at every moment to be seized by its claws, when it discovered that more appetise and fare was available. However, it took not the slightest notice of him. When he had increased their mutual separation to 10 meters, he cautiously propped himself up in a sitting position. Oh yeah, so basically this crab thing or whatever takes the remnants of the dragonfly and um, Jimmy realizes like, but my food and my water on there and I need that. So we get this, which is just very British. He cautiously closed in on the crab, approaching from right rear. While he kept station with it, he studied the complicated rhythm of its legs until he could anticipate where they would be at any moment. When he was ready, he muttered a quick excuse me and shot swiftly in to grab his property. Jimmy had never dreamed that he would one day have to exercise the skills of a pickpocket and he was delighted with his success. 
He was out again in less than a second and the crab never slackened its steady pace. And I just thought this was cool. Uh, slowly Jimmy held up his outstretched hands. Men had been arguing for 200 years about this gesture. Would every creature everywhere in the universe interpret this as see, no weapons? But no one could think of anything better. And I love that. I've actually come across that same question as somewhere else before and I, I can't for the life of me remember where it was. So I thought this was quite interesting. Uh, he says, the great fields were virgin, lifeless, waiting for crops that had never been planted. Jimmy wondered what their purpose could be, since it was incredible that creatures advanced as the Ramans would engage in any form of agriculture. Even on Earth, farming was no more than a popular hobby and a source of exotic luxury foods. But he could swear that these were potential farms, immaculately prepared. He'd never seen Earth that looked so clean. Each square was covered with a great sheet of tough, transparent plastic. He tried to cut through it to obtain a sample, but his knife would barely scratch the surface. Uh, and then they, a bunch of them are on the sea, and in the sea, and um, there's like a tidal wave basically. But we get, the disturbance had left the water swirling around in random eddies, and it also stirred up a most peculiar acidic smell, like crushed ants, as Jimmy aptly, aptly put it. Like crushed ants, that's very specific. I, I cannot tell you what crushed ants smell like. And um, yeah, there's some talk about trying to capture one of the like alien animals or whatever they see. Um, I've got to have a specimen. You may have to be content with Jimmy's flower unless one of these creatures cooperates with you. Force is out. How would you like it if something landed on Earth and decided that you would make a nice specimen for dissection? I don't want to dissect it, said Laura, not at all convincingly. I only want to examine it. Well, alien visitors might have the same attitude towards you, but you could have a very uncomfortable time before you believe them. We must make no move that could possibly be regarded as threatening. He was quoting from ship's orders, of course, and Laura knew it. The claims of science had a lower priority than those of space diplomacy. And as they should. And later on, Commander Norton's thinking to himself, he doesn't want to be remembered by history as the man who started the first interplanetary war. And so Commander Norton, basically uh, the people from, where is it? Is it from, uh, I don't know, Neptune? I can't remember, it might not be Neptune, it's one of the other planets anyway, the people from one of the other planets, because they've all been um, settled at this point, or not all of them, but some of them have, um, one of them launches like a nuke at Rama, basically, and so we get, to act or not to act, that was the question, never before had Commander Newton felt such a close kinship with the Prince of Denmark, whatever he did, the possibilities for good and evil seemed in perfect balance, he was faced with the most morally difficult of all decisions, if his choice was wrong, he would know very quickly, but if he was correct, he might never be able to prove it. So he has to decide whether to try and stop this bomb or not. Um, and they decide they're going to go out and try and stop it. Rodrigo's going to go out. And he's going out on this scooter. And I just thought this was cool. This nice little attention to detail. The scooter had been stripped of all unnecessary equipment. It was now merely an open framework holding together propulsion, guidance and life support systems. Even the seat for the second pilot had been removed. For every kilogram of extra mass had to be paid for in mission time. And we get this, uh, that was one of the reasons, though not the most important, why Rodrigo had insisted on going along. It actually means why he'd insisted on going alone. Um, they just didn't pick up that typo in this edition, I guess. And so Rodrigo, anyway, he, um, he disarms the bomb and then he kind of redirects its trajectory. And uh, it says here, it would miss Rama by a wide margin and it could be located again with a precision at any future time. It was, after all, a very valuable piece of equipment. Lieutenant Rodrigo was a man of almost pathological honesty. He would not like the Hermians to accuse him of losing their property. Okay, just one final thing I want to share here. Literally the last couple of lines. Um, so we find out what Rama is. I'm not going to spoil it with you and what's going on. Um, and it leaves, basically. It leaves the solar system. Uh, and we get, And on far on Earth, Dr. Carlisle Pereira had as yet told no one how he had woken from a restless sleep with a message from his subconscious still echoing in his brain. The Ramans do everything in threes. It's very true, they do. Interesting. So yes, uh, all in all, Rendezvous with Rama. Probably, well for me, it's the best Arthur C. Clarke that I've read. I don't know for sure whether it's the best one out there because I haven't read all of his works yet, but definitely very strongly recommended. 4.5 out of 5 for me and strong contender for Book of the Quarter. Really good place to start if you're new to Arthur C. Clarke's work. Uh, I like the fact that it reads almost like an adventure novel, even though it's science fiction. Like it reminded me of um, uh, of like Jules Verne or even like um, Arthur Conan Doyle with his The Lost World. Um, so yes, really cool stuff. Lots of great characterization, a gripping plot. You just have to keep reading to find out what happens next, so definitely recommend it. So there we have it, that's what I made of Rendezvous with Rama. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.